Okay, th thank you, Martin, for um, that uh, very generous uh, introduction and uh, just to congratulate all of the organisers on a, on a wonderful conference uh, here today. Uh, there's a lot I want to cover in this talk, so I'll, I'll, I'll get to it. My presentation today will focus on the four critical weeks between the signing of the treaty on the 6th of December 1921 and the Dáil vote for ratification on the 7th of January 1922. And I'll be arguing that it was in this critical four week period, uh, essentially, that the case for the treaty uh, was uh, won. While the fate of the treaty was ultimately decided in the Dáil, it is clear from the record of the Dáil debates that public opinion weighed heavily on many of its members and may have swung the vote for ratification. In Longford, as elsewhere, the local councils, Sinn Féin clubs, farming associations and other bodies all made their views known, thus contributing to a national discussion which, according to the Longford leader, was, quote, debated eagerly by young and old tirelessly. The presentation is divided into four parts, with the focus on, firstly, the genesis of the treaty as signed on the 6th of December 1921, the pre-Christmas 1921 Dáil Treaty debate, local debates in County Longford, and finally, the impact of public opinion when the Dáil debate resumed. Um, after the Christmas adjournment. At 10 minutes past two in the early hours of Tuesday, the 6th of December 1921, the Articles of Agreement for a Treaty between Great Britain and Ireland, better known as the Anglo-Irish Treaty, was signed in Downing Street. Despite its shortcomings, the, the Arthur Griffith-led Irish delegation accepted the deal dominion status for the 26 counties of uh, Southern Ireland, which as we heard this morning in Cormac's uh, presentation uh, was defined in the 1920 Government of Ireland Act. As a, uh, as a self-governing dominion, the proposed Irish Free State would take its place alongside Australia, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa within the uh, newly emerging British Commonwealth. However, members of the Free State Parliament would have to swear an oath of allegiance to the new state and an oath of fidelity to the British monarch. The treaty also recognised the right of Northern Ireland, also established under the 1920 legislation, to opt out of the free state, with a boundary commission to determine the frontier between the two jurisdictions. This proposal for a boundary commission arose quite late in the negotiations and was suggested as a means of sidestepping the thorny issue of, uh, north, of the northeastern corner of the island. By the 5th of December 1921, Griffith and Collins, as the senior members of the delegation, concluded that these were the best terms they could get. Now they had to return home to convince the Dáil the various arms of the independence movement and the country itself, that this was a necessary compromise. To understand the genesis of this settlement, we must go back to the truce of the 11th of July 1921. And of course, we've heard all about the truce in Porrick's uh, presentation. After the truce came into effect, the aspirations of the independence movement for full independence as a 32 county Irish Republic collided with the strength of British imperial power and the fact that the war of independence had ended in a stalemate. In this context, Eamon de Valera traveled to London to meet with the British Prime Minister David Lloyd George on the week of the 14th of July. During these preliminary talks, it became clear that the British government would look to the new Irish state to owe allegiance to the British crown and to take its place as a self-governing dominion within the Commonwealth. In short, if permitting all or part of Ireland to leave the UK, the British were going to insist that it remain closely aligned with the British Empire. And of course, at this time in 1921, the British Empire was at the height of its power. And as far as the British were concerned, the British Empire itself rested on uh, allegiance uh, to the crown all across the empire. 
In July, De Valera rejected settlement based on this outline. However, communication lines remained open. Finally, on the 29th of September, the British issued a fresh invitation to formal negotiations to, quote, ascertain how the association of Ireland with the community of nations known as the British Empire may be reconciled with Irish national aspirations. This invitation was, was accepted. Meanwhile, on the 14th of September, the Dáil had appointed a delegation of plenipotentiaries. It comprised Arthur Griffith, Michael Collins, Robert Barton, Eamon Duggan and George Gavin Duffy. De Valera had argued that as president of the Republic, he was head of state, just like his opposite number, King George V, who would also not be represented in the negotiations. And of course, some historians have argued that this position would enable De Valera in the event of a breakdown in negotiations uh, to step in at the 11th hour. Although the Dáil had conferred full plenipotentiary powers on the delegation, De Valera had instructed them to refer back to Dublin on any main question and with the complete text of any treaty about to be signed. In addition, neither the Dáil, Sinn Féin nor the public were aware that the cabinet had entered into negotiations for external association in the knowledge that a republic would not be on offer. Under external association, a new Irish state would voluntarily associate with Britain and the self-governing dominions, but would not itself be a member. And this, of course, would mean that the new state would acknowledge the British crown as head of the Commonwealth, um, but would not concede an internal role in the affairs of the new state to the crown. But of course, from a British perspective, such a concession would have undermined uh, the whole British Empire from Africa uh, to India, as we heard from Cormac this morning. Therefore, there were two clear objectives for Sinn Féin in the treaty negotiations. The extent of the sovereignty to be obtained for the new state, given the constraints set out in the British invitation, and two, how to achieve a form of Irish unity given that Northern Ireland was already established under the 1920 legislation. Facing the, British, or facing the Irish delegation was a British team representing the Liberal Conservative coalition that had led Britain through the First World War. Indeed, the timing of the negotiations was somewhat complicated by the fact that the Tory party conference was due to take place on the 17th of November, and it was believed that the Tory members of the coalition would come under pressure from the conference to break off the negotiations with Sinn Féin. The opening days of the, of the negotiations focused on the mundane issues of trade and finance before turning to the question of Northern Ireland on the 14th of October. And I just want to summarise the negotiations here. By the beginning of November, it was clear that the Irish delegation were prepared to, ex to make concessions on the Crown and Empire if the essential unity of Ireland was guaranteed. And this was the Sinn Féin position. This would, of course, put all of the presser pressure on Sir James Craig and the Ulster Unionists. On the 2nd of November, Griffith presented a letter to Lloyd George, which set out the position. The letter addressed the progress of the talks up to that point. And just to quote, I was prepared to recommend a free partnership of Ireland with the other states within the British Commonwealth. Um, and I was on the same condition prepared to recommend that Ireland would consent to a recognition of the Crown as head of the proposed Association of Free States. This attitude of mine was conditional on the recognition of the essential unity of Ireland. This was a big moment in the negotiations. The Irish delegation had brought the talks to a point where the pressure was now on Craig and the Ulster Unionists. And as noted by Keith Middlemas, this letter gave Lloyd George sufficient grounds to bring in James Craig and show him how far Sinn Féin were prepared to travel for a settlement. At that moment, some form of 32 county Irish free state with a Northern Ireland Parliament subordinate to an all-island parliament looked like it could be achievable. 
However, Craig was completely obstinate and would not give one inch, playing for time that the Tory <clears throat> conference uh, might undermine the negotiations. <clears throat> so it was at this point on the 7th of November that a depressed Lloyd George remarked to Thomas Jones that the only possible way out would be to see if Sinn Féin would accept Dominion status for 26 counties and uh, a boundary commission to determine the frontier between the two uh, jurisdictions. So, of course, J Craig's um, attitude was a real impediment uh, to progress and left the Irish position rather exposed because they had obviously made concessions on empire and crown in order to uh, uh, put the pressure of the Ulster Unionists on Irish unity. Without going into detail, by the end of November, under instruction from Dublin, the Irish delegation were back to external association, which the British had made clear was unacceptable. When it was pressed for a fourth time on the 28th of November, it nearly led to a collapse in the talks. Having won some further concessions on financial independence and the ability to pursue its own uh, trade policy and on the wording of the oath, on the 2nd of December, the Irish delegation prepared to return to Dublin to present the draft treaty to their cabinet colleagues. While Griffith had travelled back on the morning of the 2nd, Collins, Childers and Gavin Duffy stayed behind in London for further meetings before aiming to cross the Irish Sea on the Cambria, a mail boat later that night. Shortly after midnight, the Cambria had a fatal collision with a fishing vessel sailing from Liverpool. Three men on the fishing vessel actually lost their lives. So it wasn't just the uh, the arduous nature of the crossings over and back on the Irish Sea or the negotiations. A shaken uh, uh, team uh, of Michael Collins, Erskine Childers and Gavin Duffy docked in Dunleary at 10.15 a.m. on the morning of the 3rd. And they then travelled to the Mansion House for the Marathon uh, Cabinet meeting, the Marathon uh, seven hour Cabinet meeting, uh, where they would argue that the draft document, as it then stood, was the best deal on offer. It was during this meeting that De Valera said he could not recommend the draft as it then stood. He argued that the delegation could not make concessions on Crown and Empire without guarantees on essential unity. So he nonetheless instructed the delegates to press once more for external association. But there is some confusion on this point as the, the delegation were rushing to, to catch the mail boat back uh, to Britain that night. So the, the, the documentation which is available online um, isn't clear on this point, but uh, it's, it's clear also that the some members of the cabinet uh, thought that De Valera should return to London with the delegation, um, but um, De Valera reject, rejected those belated appeals at that point. So on the afternoon of the 5th of December, um, Lloyd George used James Craig's public announcement that there would be a, a deal done by the 6th of December to his advantage to put pressure on the Irish delegation to sign the treaty. He met his cabinet at uh, midday before attending further sub-conferences with the full Irish delegation. And as I said at the outset, this latter conference ended at 2.10 a.m. on the morning of the 6th of December with the signing of the treaty. And I just want to talk a little bit about the main points of the treaty. Um, so obviously the treaty conferred dominion status on the 26 counties as an Irish free state. And it was also uh, specified that the new state would have the same status as Canada and the other dominions. Obviously, parliamentarians would have to swear an oath of allegiance to the free state and recognise the British crown through an act of fidelity uh, to, to the British crown. Uh, the wording of this oath called for faith and allegiance to the constitution of the Irish free state and that members of the Dáil be faithful to His Majesty King George V, his heirs and successors as head of the British Commonwealth. Northern Ireland would have one month to uh, decide whether to opt in or opt out of the Irish Free State within one month of its constitution coming into effect. And as I said, if Northern Ireland chose to opt out, a boundary commission would determine um, the shape of the frontier between uh, the two jurisdictions. 
While attitudes to the treaty would remain fluid in the immediate aftermath of the 6th of December, at leadership level, two distinct factions quickly emerged. De Valera as president landed a heavy blow against the settlement by denouncing the treaty out of hand and voting against it during a, during a five hour meeting of the cabinet on the 8th of December. And of course, the, the photograph on the slide there of Harry Boland, Michael Collins, name and Valera was taken um, during the truce period in 1921. And of course, um, on the treaty, uh, Harry Boland, of course, um, sided against the treaty. Uh, during this cabinet meeting, de Valera called into question the delegation's action in signing the document without conferring with the ministers who had remained in Dublin. Of course, de Valera and Richard Mulcahy were actually in Limerick uh, uh, when news of the treaty, that the treaty had been signed, uh, came through and they both immediately took the train back to Dublin at that point. But I have seen some historians make the point that there has been uh, no satisfactory explanation really as to why um, you know, nobody used kind of more modern communication uh, devices available in 1921 uh, you know, to, to check with Dublin before signing. Uh, Cahill Brew and Austin Stack uh, joined De Valera in voting against recommending the agreement to the Dáil. However, W.T. Cosgrave swung the cabinet vote by, by siding uh, with the treaty so that it passed at the cabinet by four votes to three. This cabinet meeting took place against the backdrop of popular support for the treaty, with that week's local and national newspapers coming out uh, in favour of the settlement. In its December 10th issue, the Longford leader carried news uh, of the treaty on its front page, uh, leading with news that de Valera was opposed to the settlement. And his 8th of December statement was carried uh, in full on the front page uh, of the Longford leader. Of course, in this statement, de Valera said, quote, the terms of this agreement are in violent conflict with the wishes of the majority of this nation, as expressed freely in successive elections during the past three years. I feel it my duty to inform you immediately that I cannot recommend the acceptance of this treaty, either to Dáil Éireann or to the country. Underneath, the, the uh, paper carried Arthur Griffith's shorter statement in which he stated that, quote, I have signed the Treaty of Peace between Ireland and Great Britain. I believe that this treaty will lay the foundation of peace and friendship between the two nations. What I have signed I shall stand by in the belief that the end of the conflict of centuries is at hand. Under the heading Ireland Free, the Longford leader editorial on the 10th of December endorsed the treaty. It framed the historic settlement with reference to the history of English involvement in Ireland stretching back to 1172 as you can see on the slide when quote the English invasion of Ireland took place. The editorial also referenced the Act of Union of 1801 and the risings of 1798 1848 and 1867, as well as the constitutional movement that had been started in the 19th century. Quote, all failed and it remains to the men of this day by cohesion and determination, beginning in 1916 and culminating on Tuesday last, to put an end once and for all to English administration and Irish affairs. More detailed analysis of the deal, however, was for another day with the editorial concluding that, thus after 700 years, the chains which have bound Ireland have been snapped asunder and Ireland is free. And of course, by endorsing the treaty, as I said, uh, you know, the Longford leader was very much in keeping with uh, most local and uh, indeed national newspapers um, in their uh, initial responses to the, to the news of the treaty. While it's clear that the public domain had greeted the treaty with a mixture of relief and support in the days after it was signed, its fate ultimately rested on the Dáil, a body that was made up, of course, of Sinn Féin uh, TDs elected in May 1921. To carry a majority in the Dáil, uh, the pro-treatyites would need to demonstrate that the settlement, despite the trappings of British imperialism, 
could in fact be reconciled with Irish aspirations for unity and full independence as a republic. And I think it's worth pointing out at this at this juncture that uh, many of the supporters of the treaty were themselves uncomfortable with uh, some of the uh, clauses in the treaty, uh, particularly uh, the oath. So, I mean, uh, you know, the treaty was uh, was not an ideal document for either side, as you will see. The Dáil debates began with a bitter row between de Valera and Griffith. As he recounted the instructions issued to the delegation, de Valera claimed that these were all done with the exception of paragraph three, that any draft treaty about to be signed will be submitted to Dublin uh, for approval. Griffith um, rejected this accusation, stating, quote, I wish to say as regards any suggestion that the delegation exceeded their instructions that I, as chairman, immediately controverted. There was then another argument about whether it was in the public interest to have the delegation's credentials and the instructions they were issued with discussed in public. So in the end, all sides agreed that there would be private debate in the Dáil about the genesis of the settlement with matters pertaining to ratification taking place in public session. Although the private sessions of the Dáil uh, debate were dominated by um, how the treaty uh, came to take the shape that it took. Collins and Griffith worked to refute Republican accusations that the treaty was a betrayal of those who had died for a republic. And they, they, they did this by sending out TDs who were prominent military leaders in the War of Independence, like Longford, Sean McKeown, uh, Sean Hales from Cork, uh, Owen Duffy from Monaghan, uh, and Richard Mulcahy, of course, uh, in Dublin Northwest, who um, was chief of staff. These TDs spoke to the Dáil as plain soldiers and could offer uh, an assessment of the military situation. Speaking on the 17th of December, quote, as a plain soldier who realises what it is to be at war, Sean McKeown addressed the lack of arms and ammunition at his disposal. While admitting that he objected to some aspects of the treaty, McKeown claimed that the proposed evacuation of Britain's armed forces was a guarantee of Irish interests and that the treaty could allow Ireland to develop. He also said, he also asked the Dáil to wonder, to quote, understand me as a plain soldier who realises what it is to be at war and I want everybody to realise I am prepared to go into it now just the same as I went in before. I want everyone to realise what we are going in for, because I hold we have a duty to the civil population. Um, during the private session, de Valera introduced his document number two, which of course uh, was basically the proposal for external association. Uh, the historian John Regan uh, argues that this was a, a mistake on de Valera's part, because this uh, allowed the pro-treatyites to demonstrate uh, to the Dáil that de Valera, for, despite his opposition to the treaty, was not offering them a route to an Irish Republic either. And of course, the pro-treatyites were able to exploit this when the public session resumed the following week. In that public session, which commenced on Monday the 19th of December, uh, the pro-treaty deputies pressed de Valera to bring forward document number two uh, for the public to uh, to make it available to the public. However, uh, the Cancorlia Owen McNeil uh, ruled in de Valera's favour. Griffith, in his speech proposing the treaty, offered a stout defence of the delegation's performance, stating that they were, quote, given a task that was as hard as was ever placed on the shoulders of men. We faced that task and we knew that whatever happened, we would have our critics. Furthermore, as you can see on the slide, he went on to underline what had been won by the delegation. While the settlement was a compromise, it, quote, is a treaty of equality. And because of that, I am standing by it. We have come back from London with that treaty. Sir Stoughton Heron recognised the free state of Ireland We've brought back the flag. We've brought back the evacuation of Ireland after 700 years by British troops and the formation of an Irish army. Now in public session, the pro-treatyites again deployed uh, 
for want of a better term, the, the fighting men to good effect. For tactical reasons, Sean McKeown was chosen to second Griffith's motion in the public se session. It was hoped that McKeown could again counter the impression that senior IRA figures were opposed to the treaty. In his speech, uh, seconding Gr uh, Griffith's motion, McKeown assured the Dáil that the agreement bought, brought back from London represented what he and his colleagues had fought for. And I'll just quote from uh, Sean McKeown's Dáil speech. I take this course because I know I am doing it in the interests of my country, which I love. To me, symbols, recognition, shadows have very little meaning. What I want, what the people of Ireland want, is not shadows but substances. And I hold that this treaty between the two nations gives us not shadows but real substances. And for that reason, I am ready to support it. Furthermore, the treaty gives Ireland the chance for the first time in 700 years to develop her own life in her own way. To me, this treaty gives me what I and my comrades fought for. It gives us for the first time in 700 years, the evacuation of Britain's armed forces out of Ireland. It also gives me my hope and dream, our own army, not half equipped, but fully equipped to defend our interests. If the treaty were much worse in words than it is alleged to be, once it gave me these two things, I would take it and say, as long as the armed forces of Britain are gone and the armed forces of Ireland remain, we can develop our own nation in our own way. McKeown's contribution made uh, quite an impact. And of course, uh, some on the Republican side were very critical of McKeown and uh, Dan, Dan Breen uh, wrote privately to McKeown to refute uh, what he had said in terms of it being what he and his comrades had fought for. Later in the debate, when anti-treaty speakers were quoting uh, what uh, the dead who had died for a republic would make of the treaty, uh, one pro-treatyite responded, we have no right to say how any man who is dead would have voted. It is a mere accident that Commandant McKeown has not inscribed his name on the tomb of Irish martyrology. And of course, Collins himself um, uh, concluded his own speech by asking the doll to focus on the living uh, rather than the dead. I don't want to um, repeat what, what was said this morning, um, but just to say in, in regards Partition, uh, partition uh, received remarkably little attention in the Dáil Treaty debates, apart from uh, the contributions of Sean McEntee on the anti-treaty side. Um, and I think this reflects the fact that there was a, an expectation that um, the Boundary Commission would uh, award territory uh, to the Free State when it when it met, and that this would uh, potentially leave. Uh, Northern Ireland uh, unviable. And so I think there was a, a widespread expectation on that. It was only after um, six months after the treaty vote, the partition began to emerge as a bigger issue. And, and subsequently, uh, in the mid 1920s, <clears throat> after the failure of the Boundary Commission, it became uh, an, it became a, an issue that the, the Republicans uh, focused on. With so many members pardon me, of the Dáil determined to speak, it was clear on the afternoon of the 22nd of December that a Christmas recess might be in order, and the Dáil agreed to adjourn until the 3rd of January. <clears throat> it was during the Christmas recess that uh, public opinion um, asserted itself. By the time the Dáil debate resumed on the 3rd of January 1922, some 328 public bodies had come out in support of the treaty, with just five voting against ratification of the treaty. In its Christmas Eve issue, the Longford leader had its first opportunity to comment on the Dáil debate as it had unfolded in public session. In its Christmas Eve issue, the Longford leader carried a stark editorial on the political situation, stating that the issue at stake is a grave one. Which will it bring us, peace or war? A week later, in its New Year's Eve issue, the leader suggested that the gravity of the treaty debate had overshadowed Christmas 1921. It remarked that it had been a quiet Christmas with the treaty debate hanging over the county. Christmas Day itself was mild, thus denying, quote, our local skaters a turn on the canal during the holidays, 
leading them to seek consolation in Gulf and prolonged discussion of the peace treaty. Although the treaty debates had cast a shadow over Christmas 1921, it was clear that public opinion was siding with the pro-treatyites. And for the next few minutes, I'm going to focus on some of the local debates that took place in County Longford. And I will quote quite heavily uh, from uh, deliberations of county urban and district councils. Local treaty supporters stressed, uh, or I should say the local debate mirrored the Dole debate in that local treaty supporters stressed that while this, the settlement was imperfect, it offered a stepping stone to full independence, while those who were anti-treaty saw it as a betrayal of the dead and were opposed to the oath, given that they had already sworn an oath to the Republic. A specially convened meeting of Longford County Council on Tuesday the 27th of December had heard near unanimous support for the treaty. Councillor Michael Burke's motion for the treaty, seconded by Councillor Peter Farrell, was worded as you can see on the slide, we, the members of Longford County Council, believe that the treaty, although not our ideal, offers a basis of freedom by giving us control of our vital national resources. We also believe that its rejection would give our enemies an opportunity to alienate world sympathy and to smash the national movement. Speaking in favour of the motion, Councillor James O'Neill received a round of applause for a fiery speech in which he declared that the national leaders, quote, were sent over to England to make the best fight they could for us. They made a good fight and the terms they succeeded in getting are the best since Strongbow first landed in Ireland. Also speaking for the motion, Councillor John Belton pointed out that with the terms agreed, quote, we have got 90% of what we asked. If we, if we refuse that, there is no alternative but war. I am in favour of the resolution, as I see no alternative. We must stand by our representatives. Councillor Patrick McCarthy then rose to propose a counter motion urging rejection of the treaty. Councillor McCarthy stated, quote, I do not want dissension in the country, but I cannot agree with the terms of the treaty. Undoubtedly, it is a case of the poor man in Ireland again. And what could we expect from Downing Street or from the Downing Street rookery? He could not support the resolution. Reflecting on the county council vote, the Longford leader uh, declared that one conclusion emerges clearly from the whirl of debates. The treaty must be ratified. Quote, the country has made up its mind and its voice is now being heard. The will of the people must prevail. And we have no doubt that when the Dáil Éireann assembles on the 3rd of January, the treaty and the men who made it will be uh, vindicated. By the 7th of January, however, the treaty had also been endorsed by the two district councils in the Granard area. By, by Longford Urban Council, and as you can see on the slide, by the County Longford Farmers Association, uh, the Longford County Executive of Sinn Féin, and the uh, county and the party's uh, organisation in South Longford. There was some much needed levity, in fact, when at the opening of the County Longford Farmers Association meeting, the chair, John Kenny, lightened the mood by remarking that he was glad to see the members quote, all looking so well after such a drunken Christmas. However, the district council meetings were marked by more robust debate than had been seen at the county council meeting. And I'm just picking the Granard uh, district council here as an example, because there was a, a particularly heated uh, debate at this meeting. Anti-treatyite Sean Lynch believed there were two clauses that were an insult to the Irish nation, namely the oath and the clause relating to compensation for the RIC. This was not, he said, what Terence McSweeney, in the full glory of his manhood and who had suffered agony beyond description, or Kevin Barry, who faced the hangman on that black November morning, had died for. James Gavigan in the chair thought it was unfair to be quoting the dead and responded, that they, must consider, that they must consider the many heroes who died, were they alive, uh, would be possibly with Arthur Griffith for the ratification of the treaty. Another pro-treatyite, Thomas Masterson, 
responded that Sean McKeown had, quote, suffered more than anybody else. He was always he has always proved himself a man of courage and judgment, and he is the man the people will follow and support. And I just to quote further from this speech, the year that we have gone through has brought sorrow and suffering to many homes in County Longford. Some have lost their dearest and best and others have had the bread earner and principal means of support taken away. We do not want to go back to that war. A real return of the looting, burning and murder in the dead of night. The treaty, he concluded, does not prevent the onward march of the Irish nation. And I should note that the, the father of, of uh, Sean Connolly, JJ Connolly, uh, also spoke at this meeting uh, urging uh, ratification of the treaty. And he said that he was supporting the treaty because he believed the people are wholly in favour of ratification. And when the welfare of the country is concerned, personal views should not count. Enough lives have been sacrificed and the people should take the freedom offered under the treaty. Uh, the, at the Granard District Council, um, the treaty was carried by nine votes to three. But I just want to give an example here from County Cavan, um, because at the County Cavan Farmers Association meeting on the 3rd of January uh, 1922, um, there was a debate on the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And I think this debate kind of shows how uh, in the immediate aftermath of the treaty, there was still quite a degree of, of mutual respect across the, the treaty divide. Obviously, um, the treaty divide would uh, harden and become more bitter uh, in the months that followed. So this meeting in Cavan was opened by Thomas Smith, a pro-treatyite, who observed that, quote, each side contained thinking men and fighting men who were motivated to do the best thing for the country. One of the members, uh, Michael Sheridan, then rose to enter uh, an emphatic protest against ratification of the treaty. Sheridan spoke with authority as the brother of the late Tom Sheridan, who died in the Matter Hospital Dublin from wounds sustained during attack on the RIC near Balignac on the 27th of May 1920. And indeed, there was a Longford connection here because um, uh, the wounded uh, Tom Sheridan was brought to Longford and subsequently Sean McKeown and Stephen McGreeny risked their own lives to bring him uh, to Dublin to the Matter Hospital because it was the only uh, chance he had of saving his life. Soon after this incident uh, in May 1920, Crown forces raided the Sheridan family home, abusing his parents and setting the roof on fire. Given his own family struggles, Michael Sheridan's speech focused on the sacrifices that had been made by those who had paid the ultimate price and questioned whether the treaty was what they had fought for. I, for one, will never consent to a unanimous voice going from this meeting in favour of ratification of the treaty, because whether you believe it or not, I have been through the mill. I have seen England's paid assassins put my father against the wall with revolvers to his breast. I have seen abuse of my aged mother in search of the house for my wounded brother. I have looked down the barrels of their revolvers. We must all forgive injury, but I shall not forget. Although Sheridan's uh, impassioned plea impacted those present, the meeting of Cavan farmers nevertheless voted in favour of the treaty. However, bringing the meeting to a conclusion, pro-treatyite Thomas Smith in the chair stated that in declaring the Calvin farmers support for the treaty, quote, I may add that any, any country should feel proud of the pluck and courage of Mr. Sheridan in putting forward his views so ably and fearlessly. So on the resumption of the Dáil debate in early January, on the 3rd of January, I should say, it was clear that the mood of the country during the Christmas adjournment had made an impact. Cork TD JJ Walsh claimed that the break had shown him that nine out of 10 people in that city, in fact, supported the treaty. Um, Roscommon TD Daniel O'Rourke uh, went further 
confirming that he was in fact opposed to the treaty and if the vote had been taken in December he would have voted against the treaty. However referencing uh, speaking to his constituents in Roscommon uh, many of who many of them who had been involved in the the campaign for independence O'Rourke uh, came to the conclusion that quote unanimously they said to me that there was no alternative but to accept the treaty so Daniel O'Rourke uh, voted for the treaty but of course he remained an anti-treaty item and, and, and went on to become a Fianna Fáil uh, TD subsequently. With the treaty being passed narrowly in the Dáil by 64 votes to 57 every vote counted and the conversion of O'Rourke and others was highly significant and demonstrated the important contribution of the local debate to the national debate. Um, I should say as well here at this point um, that a number of TDs, I think six TDs in total, uh, actually represented two constituencies. So, for example, um, Sean Milroy and Arthur Griffith uh, sat for Cavan, but they also sat for uh, for Manor and Tyrone, and they were only allowed to vote uh, for one of the constituencies um, that they represented. So the the, the Dáil vote doesn't necessarily correspond with the number of, of, of TDs that there should have been uh, theoretically. And of course, in terms of uh, the Longford Westmead constituency of the four TDs representing Longford Westmead, uh, three voted for the tr for the treaty, uh, Sean McKeown, uh, Joseph McGuinness uh, and Larkin Robbins and uh, Lawrence Ginnell uh, voted against the treaty and of course was uh, one of the more prominent uh, anti treatyites I see that I'm kind of running out of time, so to conclude, uh, in a sign of things to come, the Dáil Treaty debate ended in verbal violence, with Cahill Brewer launching a blistering attack on Michael Collins, whom he denounced as a, quote, subordinate in the Department of Defence. In the months ahead, the tone of public comment became ever more bitter as the two sides put their case to the public ahead of the June 1922 uh, general election. People who had been comrades for many years became estranged in this time. As I hope this talk has demonstrated, the case for the treaty was won in that critical month between its signing on the 6th of December and the Dáil vote on the 7th of January. I believe uh, to a certain extent, uh, Collins and Griffith's acceptance of the treaty uh, wrong-footed de Valera to a certain extent and uh, left him a little bit wrong-footed uh, in that period of time. While there was little popular enthusiasm for the treaty, it was nevertheless accepted as offering an end to British rule, uh, an end to occupation by the Crown forces, uh, an end to continued hostilities, and uh, of course uh, the public had borne the brunt of the, of the War of Independence over the previous uh, two and a half years. While the fate of the treaty was decided in the Dáil, it is clear that public opinion was a vitally important consideration. The Christmas break uh, gave the local county, urban and district councils, Sinn Féin clubs, farming associations, labour bodies, etc. an opportunity to meet, discuss the merits of the treaty and pressure their local TDs uh, to vote for ratification. And of course, this they did narrowly on the 7th of January 1922, as I've outlined. The general election of 16th of June 1922 showed that the public broadly supported the treaty, with the election of 58 pro-treaty Sinn Féin TDs, 36 anti-treaty Sinn Féin TDs, 17 Labour TDs, 7 Farmers Party TDs and 10 independents. This was not enough, however, to prevent the split escalating into full-scale civil war, which commenced with the attack on the anti-treaty IRA garrison that had been in the four courts uh, since April 1922. Uh, so this, uh, so the Free State moved against the IRA in the four courts on the 28th of June uh, 1922, bringing the, the civil war or beginning the civil war. That civil war would further harden and cement the treaty divide in towns, communities and families across the country. Thank you very much.